Now we are also going to talk about uh, uh, history in space and time, about uh, coral reef biodiversity, but we are going to focus on one particular group of uh, uh, fish that uh, clown fishes are. So here you have the, the example of the Antiphonic Rupest, which is endemic to the Maldives, so maybe you know that guy if you dive somewhere around. And so, first of all, I would like to uh, mention briefly uh, how striking is clownfish diversity. So if you are familiar with Disney movies, you probably know that guy already, so this is uh, Nemo from Tiny Nemo. And uh, regarding how it is drawn and uh, where it lives, we can suppose that it is an Antiprion vertula, so which is one particular species of clown fishes. But actually, it's quite difficult to, to say in a way because some other species that are closely related look like uh, Antiprion vertula and are very uh, difficult to distinguish sometimes in the field. So here is an example of uh, Antiprion ocellaris uh, with orange and black variants. So you will also have sometimes variation within species. Uh, another example is Premnas, that is also uh, very similar to the uh, others. And uh, to speed up a little bit, uh, there are actually almost 30 species of clown fishes uh, with different shapes, with different colors, with different habitats and ecology. So altogether, it's uh, important to uh, study this kind of group of organisms that are highly diversified to understand how biodiversity arises. So in terms of scientific question, we want to know actually how all the clownfish species we have today diversified for a common ancestor. So we consider the diversity we observe nowadays and we want to uh, go back in the past and try to know how uh, these species diversified from a common ancestor, so we don't know how it looked like because it probably disappeared today, but we would like to uh, try to understand the process. And so I wanted to uh, explain a little bit what uh, happens in terms of geography and ecology. So actually I didn't know that Oscar already did that uh, very uh, well. So I wanted to talk about the consequences of uh, divergence after geographic isolation. Uh, I wanted to illustrate it with uh, spots and dots, but actually can also work with elephants, so <laughs> I'm going to be uh, quite uh, quickly on this part. So you can have populations uh, in a given environment, if, and if at some point a uh, barrier appears and split the area in two parts, you can expect that after a certain amount of time, uh, populations that are not able to cross these barriers are going to accumulate uh, mutations on their DNA, and little by little they are becoming uh, divergence and uh, species. So to illustrate briefly this example, we can mention these two uh, fish species that are living one uh, more on the Atlantic uh, Ocean in the Caribbean Sea and the other one more on the Eastern Pacific. So today uh, we can see that they uh, display different colors. They are also uh, divergent in terms of genetics. But actually uh, from molecular data we know that they, uh, they are divergent is consistent with the closure of the Panama Isthmus. So it means that probably in the past we have like a common and undifferentiated population and following uh, the closure of the Isthmus of Panama, populations from both sides uh, could not meet together and accumulated uh, differences. And uh, to uh, give another example with uh, some terrestrial systems, we have also these two species of squirrels, so they live in the, in the US. And so both of them are living uh, either on one side or the other of the Great Canyon. And also we know now from genetic data and also from phenotypic differences. So here, for instance, you can see that the tails are not uh, of the same color. It's not very easy to see. That the divergence between these two uh, uh, species is actually consistent with the uh, formation of the Great Canyon. So nowadays it cannot cross. But there is another fundamental process that is able to uh, uh, promote uh, diversification of uh, organisms, and this is more related with uh, ecology. And the important element with ecological divergence is that it doesn't require uh, necessarily a strict isolation between populations to observe uh, divergence. So again, if I take the example with an area uh, with populations that are at the beginning connected, 
you can imagine that uh, little by little you have uh, variations that appear in terms of ecological conditions. So, for instance, here you can imagine a dry uh, environment that is deserty on the right and uh, something more green and lush on the left. And what is going to happen is that populations are going to adapt little by little to local conditions. So, after a certain amount of time, they will be uh, locally adapted the ecological condition and they have no really interest to go in another environment into which they will not be adapted so they would have difficulties to uh, survive and reproduce. So eventually the gene flow is also uh, broken between the two uh, populations, between the two uh, environments and we can observe uh, the formation of new species. And uh, to give a real life example, we can take into account uh, this um, example with uh, peromyscus mice or pocket mice. So they are living in uh, North America and uh, so they are closely related species now and depending on where they live, uh, they exhibit uh, striking different patterns of coloration. So if they live in uh, meadows and grasslands, they are usually darker. So they can be hidden in the vegetation and can escape more easily uh, predation uh, pressures, so in particular from raptors. Whereas in uh, sandy environments and in particular on beaches uh, around the coast, they are usually um, uh, lighter in terms of um, uh, coloration. And so it's an advantage in this given environment to escape predators. And the cool thing with these mice is that actually we know very well uh, what happens from the genes to uh, the uh, phenotype we observe, so to the coloration, because we know the mutations that are responsible for either the patterning of the, correlation, the coloration, sorry, or uh, of the um, uh, deposition of the given pigments on the hairs directly on the mice. But what we have to keep in mind is that actually when we observe a real example in nature and want to study it, what we observe is a often the outcome of both geographic isolation and ecological differentiation. And one of the main objectives that uh, people working on these kind of questions have today is to try to disentangle a little bit the relative contribution of geography and ecology in uh, population divergence and uh, species formation. And another question that is interesting is to try to go directly from the genes, the genes to the phenotype so it means finding the genomic basis of uh, this uh, variation, this phenotypic variation. And again, I'm going to show you uh, one example with this uh, Elipomus butterflies. So they are highly diversified butterflies with uh, very nice colors and patterning. And uh, now we uh, sequenced several individuals and several genomes so we can really associate with a good resolution which kind of mutation, so here on the right, is responsible to uh, which band, which spot, and which colors on the wings. So you can really try to then understand uh, in a given environment how to go from the gene to the uh, final phenotype and understand local adaptation. And so I'm going to come back uh, on clown fishes now because this is typically the kind of questions we would like to answer. So what do we know so far? So first of all, uh, we have a quite good idea already of the relationships between the several uh, species of clownfishes I showed you uh, in the first slide. And we know that definitely geographic isolation played a very important role in uh, clownfish diversification. So this is a phylogenetic tree that has been proposed by uh, some former uh, member of the team. And we know that if you look uh, each branch one by one, it seems that some what we call sister species that are closely related are Often one is more present on the Indian Ocean, whereas the other one is more on the Pacific Ocean. And so this is consistent with not uh, necessarily tectonic, because it happened at a more recent time, but more with uh, glaciation. And we know that, for instance, uh, a few thousand years ago, uh, the sea level was very different, in particular in this region of the South uh, Indo-Malay Archipelago. So the continents were almost uh, completely redrawn, and uh, there was almost a strict barrier, a barrier between Indian Ocean and Pacific Ocean. So tropical areas between the two oceans were completely uh, disconnected. And so this um, geologic uh, configuration is consistent with 
timing of divergence in many organisms, so fishes, but also mollusks and uh, all uh, marine organisms. So to sum up, this is uh, consistent with the first hypothesis I showed to you. And if you want to uh, try to uh, illustrate briefly the process, we can imagine that uh, you have first an ocean with some populations uh, living in there but that can be potentially connected. Uh, after, after a drop down in sea level, you have isolation between the two sides of uh, the areas, the living range. So populations are able to accumulate some differences and become little by little divergent. And then even if uh, the seawater goes up again, uh, uh, species are already divergent, so they should not be able to mix together again and to become again uh, a single species. But it's not so simple, and we know that uh, in uh, clown fishes, probably ecology matters too, for uh, several reasons. First of all, uh, also the former PhD student from the team had a look at several morphological traits, and we know that in this particular group of fishes, they tend to change faster than in other uh, fishes of the same family. So it means that probably something happens, so they have to respond to a constraint that makes them uh, changing more uh, quickly. And also, I'm not going to enter into the detail because uh, Anna is going to uh, explain a bit more uh, what is going on with that, but you probably know that uh, clown fishes have a complex uh, social system and interaction with sea anemones, and so it can be responsible from, uh, for several microhabitats in uh, across populations. So individuals have to adapt to these very uh, highly changing uh, habitats, and so eventually it can also create some reproductive isolation between populations. And so this is more consistent with the second hypothesis of ecology. And so how to go further now? We would like to be a bit more quantitative, and to do so, the idea is to try to sample uh, several populations from closely related species. First of all, in areas where they are uh, present alone, it means not with uh, his uh, sister species. And so we will be able to try to take into account the uh, geographic component, so how the distance between populations is able to uh, promote differentiation. And then, in the second step, we would like to sample populations in uh, this area, so in particular uh, between Indian and Pacific Ocean, in an area where usually populations are living closely related together, sometimes uh, in the same uh, locality. So, uh, in this particular context, we should be more able to disentangle the particular contribution of ecology. Because there is no uh, geographic isolation here, basically. And uh, about the sampling of this part of the project, so we already have some samples from uh, Mayotte, so thanks to uh, Loïc and his group that uh, went there in uh, October. So now you know that we are here in the Maldives and uh, we are very happy to, to be here to be able to continue our sampling. And so the idea now is to uh, also go further and have some samples uh, from New Caledonia probably in May and then uh, little by little from other uh, localities across the Indo-Pacific Ocean to have a whole picture of the story, not only at uh, local scales, but also to compare at local and regional and even global scales. And so what is very interesting in uh, the Maldives with uh, clown fishes? Uh, first of all, we have this particular um, species that uh, is illustrated already my uh, slides before. So this is Antibrion sebae. So this is, uh, uh, it, it lives in the Indian Ocean but he has a really closely related species that is more living in the Pacific Ocean, which is Antiprion polymus. So it's very interesting for us to have Sebae on this side and polymus on the other side, so we can compare them where they live uh, separated, and then we will be able to compare them with uh, Indonesian population or population from Thailand, for instance, where they are living uh, closely uh, related together. Uh, in the Maldives, and uh, Julia had uh, also uh, some elements about this species on uh, her slides, uh, this is Amphiprion clarki, which is very interesting for two main reasons. Uh, first of all, it is very widespread. It is the uh, only one species of clownfishes that you can find almost uh, everywhere in the, in the West Pacific. 
and uh, depending on the region, it can present interesting uh, variation in terms of coloration. But we actually we don't really know why. So it would be a, a good candidate to investigate how geography is uh, shaping local variation. And also to finish, uh, there is this species, so Amphitryon gripes, which is endemic from the, the region of the Maldives. And uh, at the moment, there is just uh, only a few uh, genetic resources available from, for this species. So the idea would be maybe to propose some uh, new tools that uh, will make uh, some elements to uh, propose better politics in terms of conservation, for instance, or study gene flow at a more local scale. So we will hope that we will be able to sample these three species to, to work on uh, these different aspects. And basically how we are going to process, we are going to uh, measure, um, take photography of the fish, also put some, uh, some landmarks at uh, different parts. From these landmarks with the software, you can derive uh, several morphological traits that are ecologically meaningful to study uh, diversification. And then we will compare this phenotypic variation with uh, genomes. And typically, we plan to uh, sequence the whole genome of several uh, individuals so we can uh, assess pattern of diversity and uh, diver um, differentiation, sorry. So here it is. So I would like to, to thank you, uh, everybody, for being here. So the Maldives uh, National University, uh, the Maldivian uh, authorities, uh, local NGOs, students, and crew that are going to help us uh, on the field, and of course, uh, Lloyd Group for um, uh, providing the opportunity to be uh, here with them. And also, I would like to uh, present briefly uh, how our group in the University of Lausanne, so the group of Nicolas Salana, they are working on uh, diversification, not only on plant species, but also on plants, on many organisms. And so, yeah, the, you have the winter version and the summer version of the, of the group. So thank you very much.